Hello, everyone. My name is Kasha Samel, and I'm the librarian with LA County Library's American Indian Resource Center. Welcome to tonight's Trailblazers in conversation with Piet uh, de Spain. To help kick off tonight's program, I'd like to introduce uh, our own two speakers. Leading tonight's conversation is our very own Library Director, Sky Patrick. Sky Patrick was appointed LA County Library Director in 2016. In her role, she is responsible for the library's 85 libraries, 15 mobile service vehicles, and materials and resources used by 3.4 million customers across LA County. Sky is committed to breaking down barriers and increasing access for all. In addition to helping LA County Library go find free and initiating several other services to help provide more access and opportunity for customers, Sky launched the Library's I Count Equity Initiative. The Library's I Count Equity Initiative ensures that library services and programs addresses the needs of the diverse communities across LA County. Sky continues to reinforce the library's role in the community as a civic and cultural center, a hub for public information, services and discourse, and an institution of literacy, innovation, and lifelong learning. Tonight, Sky will be interviewing award-winning chef and food activist, Piet de Spain. Piet de Spain is an award-winning traveling private chef. She is the first winner of Gordon Ramsay's Next Level Chef on Fox, and her life's work is dedicated to indigenous fusion, um, fusion cuisine, where she combines the food of her heritage, both Native American and Mexican. Piet's passion is to uplift indigenous culture and traditions via storytelling, traveling, and cooking. Piet's passion for cooking developed as a child while being the help in the kitchen. She was intrigued by the spices and aromas in her family's taquerias and restaurants in the Kansas City area. She attended culinary school to pursue a culinary education and since has earned a certification in wellness and nutrition. After launching her own business, Piet's Plate, the chef has since honed in on promoting indigenous ingredients and everyday cooking. Her latest project, My Plant Relatives, a dinner series, Chef Piet travels from city to city sharing her dishes and inspiring others to pass down their own cultural recipes from one generation to the next. Thank you, Piet, for joining us tonight. And Sky will hand the program over to you. Thank you so much, Kasha. And thank you so much, Piet. Before I get started with you, I want to take an opportunity to acknowledge the land that we are on. The County of Los Angeles recognizes that we occupy land originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, Tactavium, Serrano, Quiche, Ch and Chumash people. We honor and pay respects to their elders and descendants past, present, and emerging as they continue their stewardship of these lands and waters. We acknowledge that settler colonization, colonialization resulted in land seizure, disease, subjugation, slavery, relocation, broken promises, genocide, and multi-generational trauma. These acknowledgements demonstrate our responsibility and commitment to truth, healing, reconciliation, and to elevating the stories, culture, and community of the original inhabitants of Los Angeles County. We are grateful to have this opportunity to live and work on these ancestral lands. We are dedicated to growing and sustaining relationships with Native peoples and local tribal governments, including, in no particular order, the Fernandino Taktavium Band of Mission Indians, the Gabrielino T Tangva Indians of California Tribal Council, the Gabrielino Tangva San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians, the Gabrielino Band of Mission Indians, Quiche Nation, the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, and the San Fernando Band of Mission Indians. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm super excited about this conversation. I started to read up on you a little bit, Piet. Welcome to LA County. Thank you. Oh, what did you read? <laughs> well, that you're basically the food boss of, of, of modern times, that you do this amazing work, that you are also, I mean, as mentioned by Kasha, you also are a private chef, which of course makes me want to think like, where's your restaurant? Hopefully that, that'll be coming next. How, how, how about we start there? <laughs> Yeah, so I I am a private chef. We you know people ask like, oh, what are you like? What kind of chef are you? I, I that's a 
an, a really hard question because I'm still on the journey of kind of figuring where I'm maneuvering, you know, and pivoting my career right now as a chef. But previously, um, pre next level chef, I was a traveling private chef. I would go and cook for families that were going on vacation somewhere or, or I would okay. clients here in LA. So I had a few, you know, high profile clients and you know, people that just needed extra hands and help in their everyday lives because they had kids that they were raising and they needed someone to come in and put some healthy food on the table. So I've done a lot of things here and there as a private chef, catering events. And um, I worked like, I've never really worked in a restaurant. And so when people ask, you know, are you going to open a restaurant? I'm like, ah, maybe one day, but right now it's not my focus. I eventually want to get there and, and build my, you know, build my reputation and career up in order for that to be successful. But right now I'm really enjoying traveling and I've been able to spend a lot of time amongst uh, native communities over the past year and really just connecting, building community, getting to know the people that I, I, I want to represent through my food and I'm on a journey of learning. So as a chef, that's currently what I'm doing. And, uh, along that journey, I've kind of accumulated a few other titles like food activists, or, you know, obviously indigenous chef is probably like the, the biggest title that I've, I've, you know, take on so far as making sure that I'm highlighting both of my cultures through the food. So that's where I'm at right now. It sounds so fascinating. I'll tell you, in my house, my family loves all of these cooking shows. So when I said I was going to be interviewing, I have a feeling someone in my house somewhere is watching this. <laughs> um, well, let's get started with some of these questions so that we um, hopefully have reserved some time for our audience to ask you some questions. So uh, the first question we'd like to ask you is that Again, I've already mentioned you've had quite a journey um, in such a young age from, I want to make sure I say this right, the Osage Indian Reservation. Did I say that correct? Osage. Osage. See, that's why I ask. Osage Indian Reservation in Canada, um, in Kansas, now to an award-winning chef. Why don't you talk a little bit about your Native American and your Mexican heritage and how those two cultures have influenced uh, your career path? Yes. So um, I did grow up in between Kansas City and Oklahoma. So the Osage Reservation is um, that I grew up in what laid on the county lines of Pahuska, Oklahoma. And it was a small town of about 3000 people. It's grown since then. So that's where I grew up with my grandmother. And so between there and Kansas City is where I grew up. Now, my tribe is Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation. That's the tribe that I belong to. We are known as the fire keepers and our tribal lands are in Mayetta, Kansas. So that's where I grew up all in all. I'm a Midwest girl. And as you said, yes, it's it's been a long journey um, coming from Kansas to L.A. I decided to move here about seven years ago. I just jumped in the car and it was me and my cat and whatever couldn't fit in my car didn't come with me. So I just left, you know, everything behind to pursue this big dream of becoming I didn't know really I really didn't know what I wanted to do at the time but I knew I wanted to do something big I knew I wanted to be a chef in LA I thought you know maybe I could be a celebrity chef and, and work for celebrities and and kind of be in the homes of the rich and the famous and I think coming from like a small city or a small town and you come to LA with these big hopes and I think it's usually around the glitter and the glam of of any industry and so that's really where I was I was, you know, coming from and also being growing up in Kansas City, there is an urban area where there's it's a prime where I grew up was primarily minority. So you either have Mexican American or African American. Um it, and you had like a an, a little bit of Asian influence there as well. And so we the 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 high school that I went to was like majority Mexican um students and we had the highest dropout rate. We had the highest rate of pregnancy, there's probably 20% of each class gra actually graduated from high school. So this is just painting the picture of kind of where I grew up and where I come from. And um, luckily, I was able to, I hate saying like break away as if it was like, you know, like a hard place to be, because although there are, you know, some struggles that still happen there, there were, there are also a lot of positive things happening within our community. So just 
you know, everything has a pro and a con and this is the same from where I grew up, but I'm very proud to be from the Midwest and from Kansas, but moving here to LA was such a culture shock for me. I can completely understand that. Uh, obviously, well, maybe not so obvious, but different generations, but I had a, I had the same thing. I had a little car, a little Honda Civic. I did not have a cat. Drove across country with whatever could fit in that Honda Civic was what I owned. Uh, also coming from the Midwest uh, area, so I, I can really uh, I, I can myself to that to that storyline. I also like what you said about um, you know the complexities of coming from places that are disadvantaged and um, who have you know these different sort of co comorbidities happening simultaneously to just kind of uplift the fact that there's a lot of joy as well and so you know to balance the, the narrative i appreciate you doing that um let's talk a little bit about you as a biracial person and your biracial heritage can you uh, speak a little bit about how that has been a challenge to navigate, if indeed it's been a challenge to navigate those two identities and cultures? Oh, absolutely. So I actually have a pretty interesting upbringing. So there's a lot of information not on the internet, obviously, about me. There is a lot on, but most of, the, most of like my family dynamic, there's not a lot that's said about it. So whoever's in this, this conversation is getting like the inside scoop of Pia and her family right now. So my mom was actually adopted. So my mom is the person within my, my two parents that have the Native American um, heritage. And she was actually adopted by a Mexican and a Croatian woman or Mexican man who was from Guanajuato, Mexico, was a first generation immigrant. So him and his parents both moved here when he was very, very young and when his siblings. And so he was an immigrant from Mexico and he married a Croatian woman and um, they decided together they would um, adopt two children. So my mom being one of them and they adopted a, a boy at the same day. So she had a brother. And so my mom didn't necessarily grow up her whole life with her Native American culture and her heritage knowing that, but she also is Mexican. And um, so she did grow up with that culture, which was great. So, you know, she was about 23, 24 when she was pregnant with me and then was able to connect with her biological parents and get to know more about her Native American culture and heritage. So this was around the same time that I was born. So luckily I was born into this amazing chapter of my mother's life of her getting to know her biological family and learning more about her own culture. And then I was born in that. So I was raised with that culture and also having the Mexican side of my family and being under understanding what that culture is like too. And they're very similar. They're very similar cultures, although the traditions are different. Obviously language is very different. But there are people that love being together and food is at the center of a lot of it. Dancing is at the center of a lot of it. Music is at the center of a lot of it. And it's one of those situations where if you see someone and I think there's a lot of cultures that are like this. I don't think it's just Mexican and Native American, but we oftentimes take in people within our communities and, and care for them as if they are our own family. So there's a lot of like adoptions and stuff of other families coming in the family on my Native side. And then with my Mexican side, they're just bringing everyone's cousins and, and aunties or whoever needs help, they're bringing them in and we're all just kind of a big community together. And so that was just where, that's how I was raised of just having compassion for people within your community and understanding how community, how strong community is and how important it should be within our lives. And so with that being said, you know, there were times where I didn't feel like I didn't quite fit in, especially at a young age. Kids are so impressionable and we don't really understand the impact of our actions or our words like on our, our, our fellows, you know, uh, schoolmates and stuff. But I was picked on a lot because I did grow up, you know, when I left the reservation, I, I was at a primarily African-American school and I was the only not like one of the only not African-American, you know, girls. So I used to get picked on all the time. And so not really understanding like where I fit in in some places or I'm not Mexican enough because I don't speak Spanish or I'm not native enough because I'm a half breed and I wasn't like, you know, I didn't get, I was actually not raised on my own tribe's reservation. So there was just a lot of um, confusion there growing up. But I think all of those things now obviously created a lot of character within me and a lot of strength. But now I really like, 
I see the importance of really understanding and knowing and like feeling at home within myself and actually learning as much as I possibly can. So that way I feel confident within both of my cultures. I don't, I don't have that feeling anymore, but it's very interesting as children or as we, as we're getting older and maturing of how confusing that can be for all of us. Thank you for bringing that up. You, it's, it's such a critical conversation right now because I mean, you're, you're just speaking to so many of us, particularly in the United States are of mixed heritage and they're, um, and, and, or biracial. My family is also a biracial family. And to have this, um, conversation, this dialogue about the two entities. So for a long time, I'm sure, you know, this people had to choose, you Mm -hmm. know, you couldn't be biracial or, you know, uh, transracial and you know it wasn't really accepted and you you bring out this this idea of othering uh that happens unfortunately all too often particularly with young people and it's really exciting and maybe even affirming to hear how you have been able to absorb your mother's upbringing and the fact that she was adopted and then to like live in these two worlds um to create your own identity uh, which is which is fantastic. Do you think that um, having to create one's own identity from from the, from your two? Do you think that's how uh, your food um, focus was inspired? Oh, one hundred percent. I think you know, as a chef on this journey, I struggled a lot with also finding my niche. People would ask, "What's your niche? What's your specialty?" And at the time, I was. As you mentioned earlier, or what was mentioned earlier in my introduction, as I went to culinary school, it was a very, you know, expedited experience. And it was like one of those culinary programs where it was kind of like night school. It was an accelerated program. I learned what I needed to, took that and like ran with it. And it was like an 18 month program. It, and it taught me the basics and I learned about nutrition and wellness. And I knew at that moment, like there were a lot of um, health crises going on amongst the community that I lived in with diabetes and obesity and just um, not having the proper finances to be able to provide like healthy nutrition meals to your family. You just bought what you could afford. And that's oftentimes like, that's what I ate growing up where a lot of, you know, heavy, heavy foods, you know, heavy saturated fat foods. And so I saw within my own family health conditions and then across Native America itself, there is a lot of health crisis going on within the Native American community. So that's something I really wanted to focus on. And I was like, okay, I'm going to focus on health and wellness. And so when I would start to build my client base, I was just cooking healthy food. So that wasn't really, I'm like, it's a niche, but it's not like a cuisine. And I would hear all these beautiful stories from these other chefs about how they grew up with these, you know, uh, grandmothers that would teach them all these like recipes and this, this recipe hasn't been in their family for so long. And they have these like rich Indian influences through their family or their Italian heritages. So they're cooking like homemade pastas and all these things. And I'm like, you know, I don't really have those stories other than like, yes, I, I ate Mexican food growing up and I ate some native food, but that wasn't like in my cuisine. It wasn't in my work at the time. So I decided, you know, I think I'm going to make my niche or my specialty. And I at the time was really missing home because I, you know, moved away from home and I was missing my families, missing my friends, my culture. I had no Latina friends here in LA the first six years I was here. And I had no native friends the first six years I was here, which is crazy because we actually have a pretty decent population here. I just didn't know where to find them. I was in the wrong places, I guess. And so um, I was asking around, but I don't, it just, it didn't really come. But at that time I was like, you know, I really miss eating like, my food, food that I love, food that would be at the table with my family. And so I started bringing that into my cuisine and I started representing myself rather than trying to make me be someone that's like a mod podge of di- different cuisines of different cultures. Like, why don't I just highlight my own culture, which is this, this fusion of both Native American and Mexican. So I started really honing in on that and it really started picking up traction and people really interested in learning more about Native American and indigenous Mexican food specifically, because, you know, everyone's had a taco, a burrito, a tostada, 
but they were like, what is this indigenous? Like, what does that mean? And so people started asking more questions. And I figured like, you know, it was kind of like that moment where it just like, it hits the heart and you're like, okay, this feels right. My intuition was telling me I was on the right path. And all of these opportunities started to align for me. And so I think that's when I realized that, okay, I'm on the right path. And this is what my true calling is, is to really, um, you know, focus on, on this cuisine and bringing awareness to the culture. Thank you for that. Uh, you said so many powerful things. First of all, I will affirm you. It is very difficult to find one's community in Los Angeles, partially because it's just so dang big. And there's so many people, you know, there's nearly 10 million folks here. So I can, I completely can align with that thought. You said something else that I thought was really interesting. Obviously, the health crises in, um, in, in communities of color, that's a whole other conversation for another day. Maybe we'll bring you back to talk about that. Um, but you were talking about a niche versus a cuisine. I don't think I've ever heard it that way. And then how you had to develop your own, your cuisine based on your heritage. Can you just briefly, for someone like myself, who's not as familiar, can you give an example of what would be an indigenous, either Mexican or native cuisine? Like what, is it a spice? Are there spices? Are there, are there com components? So indigenous, so I, I, when I say indigenous food um, in other countries, they don't understand what I'm meaning because like indigenous to where, indigenous to what, like indigenous to the Americas. So basically what indigenous means is the food culture or food ingredients that was here pre-colonization, pre-European and Spanish influence, pre any influence from outside of the Americas. So the food and the people, the tribal people that were here, what did they eat? What did my ancestors eat before there were food commodities and, um, you know, like boxed instant potatoes or whatever flour and sugar, because none of that existed here. Um, and that's not what my ancestors ate, but they had to make food, you know, out of survival with these ingredients that were given to them when they were in, you know, then moved into reservations. And so indigenous is basically highlighting the food and the food culture that was here before. Now there's a huge um, decolonizer di diet um, movement that's going on within our food community right now. And that's very much so in alignment with that. Although I do 100%, you know, I support that movement. But what I'm trying to do with my food is a little different. I'm trying to use those ingredients, still highlight them and tell those beautiful stories of the beans, of the corn, of the squash, of the bison, of the salmon, and how these ingredients were honored and how they were honored and why they're so special. And so I will tell these stories, but then still take them and make them into these beautiful, more uh, modern dishes that everyone can kind of look at and, and identify like, oh, I'm familiar with some of this, but I didn't know that all this, like all these stories existed. And so that's really what I like to do with my food. And so I guess that would be my niche would be making modern day indig indigenous cuisine, which focuses on both the native American, the native indigenous to the Americas. So, and then if you're looking at indigenous from Mexico, of course, you have a little bit of a different ingredient list because they're in a different climate. You have Oaxaca that has indigenous ingredients in Oaxaca, like the Oja Santa. You have all the chiles that are down there that are highlighted in so many beautiful different ways. And so um, these are just a few that come to mind off the top of my head when it comes to indigenous ingredients of the Americas. And of course, wild game before chicken and pork and cows were here. The decolonizing the food, uh, decolonization of the food movement. I can probably speak for everybody on this uh, call here on this program to say that we wish this one were in person and that there was a demonstration component to it. Again, note for next time. Yeah. Why don't you talk a little bit about your journey um, becoming, you already talked a little bit about becoming a private chef, but how did you become a contender and a winner on reality culinary composition uh, competition? This is like how people become famous today, right? Oh, yes. So funny thing is I actually owe a lot of credit to one of my best friends back in Kansas City. Um, his name is Alfino. If he's tuning in, thank you, Alfino. But he um, actually, when I was trans 
transitioning from my move from Kansas City to um, California to LA, he ended up just like texting me one day and was like, hey, uh, I don't care what you say. I'm going to, I've already put, he already put in an application or put my name on some kind of application for MasterChef. And he was like, I think that you need to be on TV. So you're just going to apply. And like, this is going to happen. So I was like, oh my gosh, like you're so crazy. So I just kind of went with it. I was like, well, okay, whatever you say. So um, he was just very adamant about it. So I went through the whole application I did it. And I just kind of threw it into the wind and they ended up calling me and we did like a quick phone interview and I didn't make the cut. So they were like, we don't think that this is going to be for you. So we're going to move on with other people. Okay, cool. So I, I mean, it wasn't something I really cared about at the moment anyway. So I just didn't care much. Well, a couple of years later go by. And I guess once that casting crew has your profile, they keep uh-huh. it. And then they pass right. along to other casting crews that are looking for something somewhere, someone. So they'll just thumb through all of these um, uh, applications. So then um, I've got asked to do Hell's Kitchen and I passed it up because um, I, I got on the call and they explained to me the premise of the show. And I think I saw the show and I was like, you know, I don't think that's for me. And I wasn't confident enough in myself as a chef at the moment to even like take something like that on. And also I, I wasn't a line, a line cook and I would be competing with all these other line cooks. So I ended up turning that down and then I was casted for some baking show and I'm like, okay, well, I'm not really a baker either. And so I was like, you know, would, would it have been easy to say yes and be on a episode or two episodes and then be like booted off? Yes. But I don't operate that way. I have like, if I'm going to do something, it has to feel like, like the right thing. And I have to trust my instinct and my intuition. And my intuition was saying, it ain't it. This ain't it, honey. Like keep it moving. So then eventually I got a call fast forward, like another year or two years later, I got a call from the Ramsey studios casting call, uh, casting crew for next level chef at the time. They couldn't give me any information other than it was a new concept. It's professional chefs, home cooks, private chefs, social media chefs. They're all competing on the same platform at at the same level with all the same, you know, playing fields. There's no one has an advantage over anyone. So I was thinking, okay, like I can get with that. And this is like, after I had been traveling the world, like chefing it up, although I at this point had been a chef in Switzerland. I've been a chef in Hawaii several times. I was now working like the homes of the rich and famous. I've been able to work with some really expensive and cool ingredients. So I felt more confident by taking that. And so I said, okay, like, okay, Okay. Okay. Great. Well, you'd like to apply. You want to, uh, you want to do an interview. Can you do it today? And they, they called me and I was like at lunch at the time. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me go, uh, do that. And so I went and, uh, two hours went and jumped on the call, did the interview. The next day they called me, said that I got casted, had to go through the entire process, which was like a three or four day, um, background check. Mm-hmm. And then they called me on a Monday and they said, Hey, you made the cut and uh, you're going to be flying out this Friday to go shoot for the show. And I was like, wait, what? Like in like four days Friday, (laughs) they're like, yeah. So I didn't have very much time to get all of my things together, but I did it, went out and um, I got there. And I was thinking kind of the same thing that I thought before I was like, you know, this is more up my speed, but like, I didn't think I was really, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I didn't know how, well, I would stack up against the other competition. I was just happy to be there. And I thought to myself, well, even if I'm here for like two or three episodes, like at least I can put this on a resume that I I got this far. And um, we got there and I saw the competition and they were pretty like stiff competition. Like these people were are so talented, the people that I competed against. And so Long story short, um, I was the last person that got casted and I ended up being winning the show. But I think, um, you know, if I could give any specific um, comments about what I think got me through the show and what I think allowed me to win was I don't think I was ever more spiritually connected (laughs) in my life than the days that I was... um, filming for this show. Cause every day in the morning and every day when we would get back to our hotel, like I was praying, I was, I was lighting my sage and my Palo Santos. And I was like praying to creator. And I'm like, if this is for me, like, 
please allow me to get through this next competition. And I, I think I truly was like digging deep for, for all of like the strength to, to carry on through the competition because it was very hard. And um, once I finally found my legs after a few episodes, I, I don't think that the first few episodes I was really cooking like myself because it was a scary environment. So I finally got my legs and I started pulling out the piet in the competition because I am very competitive and I pulled out the flavors that I know that I'm good at. And I just stuck to what I knew. And I was just like, I just did what I did. I cooked food that I loved. And I think that's what won me the show ultimately. I love hearing this because th there are three huge takeaways to what you just said. One, sometimes you need to rely on your best friends. <laughs> Two, sometimes people see in you what you can't see in yourself, right? And you got to trust that process. And then three, of course, grounding yourself down in your spiritual uh, in your spiritual belief and just letting it go and doing the thing that you love. Um, those are those are literally words to take away from this conversation. I love that you just pulled all of that out. Uh, you know, I'm going to do a quick flip because I have so many other questions and I had so many other people who there are like, it looks like there's like 27 questions for you oh, and I will not get through them all. I think that they're going to, they're going to synthesize them for us later on. So I want to talk a little bit about something that's near and dear to our hearts and libraries, uh, near and dear to the hearts of Angelinos, people from LA County, uh, which is the topic of homelessness. Um, and, you know, you have spoken in the past pretty openly about your own lived experience with being unhoused. Um, how did you use that adversity um, and frankly, trauma, like what did, how did you feel, how did that feel you, um, to become who you are today? So growing up, I, we, my mother was a single mother of, of four. One of my older brother lived with his dad. So my mom was, you know, the primary caretaker of three of out of four of her, or her children. And, you know, it was really rough for us. And we had, you know, been homeless before and when I was a child and had to go to like women's shelter. And so we've been, I've been in that type of situation multiple times and kind of had to move around a lot from house to house or family members house and live with my grandfather for, you know, most of my childhood in a small little two bedroom home with four or five people, it's actually five people in a two bedroom home. So I've lived in uncomfortable situations before, but did I think that I was going to come to LA and like be facing a similar situation again, where I don't have a home and I'm essentially had two suitcases, my car and a cat. And like, that was all that I had to my name. Like I could not afford to live in this city. Luckily I had friends that were, you know, letting me sleep on their couch. And um, it was very uncomfortable. You know, I, I was one of those situations where, I'm, I, I'm so grateful for the people that opened their homes to me when they hadn't even known me that long, you know, and, um, this, it was just like one of those situations where I was like, how did I get here? Like, how, how is this real? And I would call my mom and just be crying. And she's like, you know, you can always come home, just come home. Like, what are you doing? Just come home. Both my parents were telling me you should come home, come back to Kansas, but something, you know, just told me, you know, that, as long as I wake up every day and I have this burning desire in my heart to keep going, like I'm going to just keep going because I don't want to regret giving up entirely on my dreams to be, you know, to be whatever it is that I wanted to be at that time. And um, it was very uncomfortable. And do I recommend anyone putting themselves through that? Absolutely not. But if you happen to be in a situation in a scenario where that is your reality, my biggest advice to anyone is to let people help you because a lot of us are too prideful and a lot of us are embarrassed of the situation that we're in that we don't want to ask for help but this was one of those situations where like I had to ask for help and had I not asked for help I could have very well have been someone sleeping in one of those tents that you see under a bridge luckily it never got to that point and I don't think that I would have ever ever allowed it to get to that point before I would just you know go home um, but it was just a situation where I had people luckily that I could rely on that allowed me to sleep on their couch. And, yeah. um, but it, it is one of those, it's a city where people have so much drive and ambition and so much fight in them. And I, and that's one thing that I really admire about this city of 
you know, of dreams. It's like the city of dreams. You know, everyone comes here with this, these high hopes for themselves and these passions. And I just wanted to make sure that I vocalized how normal that is. Even for someone like myself, no matter what you look like, what kind of background you come from, like it's very possible for you to end up in a situation like that. Anything can go wrong in life. That's and so right. I just wanted to make sure that I voiced that because of how important it is to tell people like it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to admit that you're not in a good place with people or not with people, but in a good place in your life so you can allow people in to help you because that was one of my biggest challenges. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up because we have quite a few um, of unhoused people utilizing library services, right? We're free, we're welcoming, we actually care and try to be of service. Um, I was reading something earlier today, just as as for a whole other reason, that something like 25% of unhoused people have an advanced degree. So it just starts to dispel these. And and I think you said it um, really well, like, so many people like how did i get here it could be any one of us at any time in a city and county like los angeles and so i think you just again speak truth to power that we have to do our best to be respectful you don't know anyone's story you don't know how they got there maybe they're just another person like you with the bag full of dreams and mm-hmm. it just didn't go right and so i do appreciate you saying that and i think it's a really important comment for our particular service population. So thank you for that. Um, I want to talk of, ask you a few more questions here. Um, do you wanna uh, talk a little bit about some of the misconceptions about indigenous people and it's called their culture? Is there anything that you would like to dispel, any sort of stereotype or misconception that you'd like to take an opportunity to dispel through your work or just through this call? You know, I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot there to unpack, but um, what I'm trying to do within my work is focus on the reality of where Native people are now and not focus on our past, what we've been through, where Native people, what happened to us, because although that is very much so an important part of our story and our culture and, and, you know, and allowing people to understand where we come from. But I think the most important part of the story is where are we right now? What are we doing to uplift our communities now? Where are we at as native people? Because we're not this past tense, you know, version of, of our of our lineage anymore. We're modern day natives, you know, trying to take our everyday lives and somehow interlace our traditions and keep our traditions alive. And um, it's it's just one of those situations where I don't think people really understand like what a native community looks like. And so I've gotten some like wild questions, you know, like what did, what is it like on the reservations? Like are there teepees? Like do people live in homes? Like are there horses? Like riding around on horses? You know, you get like silly questions because people do not have an idea. They don't know. And I'm like, no, you know, I explained to them um, they live in homes, houses, you know, and uh, they do drive cars. We all drive cars and uh, it's a more advanced, you know, we all live in modern day America. Um, Although there are a lot of um, communities, unfortunately, that struggle with um, just food resources, with job resources, with finding, you know, a financially stable income or a job that they can rely on that's going to be able to feed their families. And um, unfortunately, there are still a lot of struggles that Native Americans, Indigenous people go through in this country just to 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 live a normal life. You know, there's a lot of caretakers amongst our elderly um, population that are taking care of their grandchildren. I mean, that's often case the storyline and um, and those grand parents maybe aren't working and they have to care for children somehow, you know, and it's just, it's, uh, it's, you know, with my work, what I try to do is just shine a light on what we're doing now as a community and um, trying to uplift one another and provide services for one another and help and just representation of our lives. Like we're still here. We're still, you know, reaching our dreams and, and beyond. And um, I just really like, wholeheartedly believe that my work is creating a change 
within the world and the way that they see native people. We're not just a bunch of people that are getting free money from the government. People think we're getting free money from the government all the time just to be alive. And like, that's not true. And um, yes, there are casinos on our reservations, but we're not all, you know, hanging out in the casino all day, every day. And of course, like that Native Americans are alcoholics, you know, like, yes, there is, you know, substance abuse within our communities. But we also have a lot of people that don't drink anymore and walk the red road and are trying to teach our youth to stay away from substances that are going to alter your, the way that you think and um, how it can change you know, your life to live a life of sobriety. And so I tried to preach that a lot, too. But um, I think the, mo- the biggest misconception is just um, that, that Na- Native Americans are no longer here. But you know, with my work, I really try to highlight that there are still tribes here. Native American people are still here, not just here in America, but also Mexico as well. Um, There's a lot of issues going on with the tribal communities in Mexico, you know, and them not being accepted into their own society because they're looked at as like dirty, poor people, you know, um, that live in the mountains. And there's some tribes that don't even speak Spanish in Mexico and they have that language barrier. So there's just a lot of issues across the board, but I believe that, you know, with my work, I can tackle some of them and and highlight indigenous people in a way that maybe the rest of the world or the rest of this country, for that matter, don't typically see Native people being highlighted. Yeah, Oops. that's um, that's that's a really great comment. And it, of course, sparks several um, more questions for me. But um, I, I like how you talk about the, essentially food is at the, the, your food, your passion is at the intersection of all of these different layers of your history and your future. Um, I, I'm also interested, you know, or maybe I'll share with you, I think several people on the call, we are familiar with the fact there are 200 languages spoken in Los Angeles County. Um, when you really think about that, you realize that more than half of those languages are indigenous languages. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity for us to uh, uplift those communities and just remind people who's here, who was here, who continues to be here. And I think that's that's really the genesis of the land acknowledgement as well. Um, you mentioned something that I actually have never heard, and I just want to take an opportunity to ask, what is the red road? You said someone walking the red road. I've never heard that before. What is that? Yeah, so walking the red road means that you walk, um, you live your life uh, through sobriety and traditions. And so you stay away from um, alcohol and drug abuse, or you stay away from it in general. Because as we believe, these mind altering substances really poison your mind, they poison your perspective, they poison your community, they poison the way that you react to situations. Mm -hmm. And when you are not level headed, you can't make clear conscious decisions and you can't be someone that your community can rely on. So walking the red road is leading by example. Um, you're pure, you're, you're practicing those, those strong uh, indigenous and native traditions. Um, so an alcohol abuse is really huge within our communities. And so when people are native people talk about, you know, I walk the red road, it's, you know, that that person is practicing sobriety, they're leading by example for the people within their community, and they are able to be um, relied upon from their community because they are making the decisions to live their life through tradition. Oh, I love that you said that. Um, So that's a new one for me. Thank you for sharing that. I have one more question and then I have to move into the uh, questions from our audience. And that means I'm skipping several, but let's, um, what are you involved in right now? What are you doing? So that's a good question. I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, There's a lot of things that I'm doing right now, but the most important, I'll, our dinner series that they meant that was mentioned, uh, my plant relatives, I hosted one. Um, back in February. And uh, it basically is a eight course chef's table. It's a dinner where I bring in Native American dancers to showcase the traditional dancers. Uh, There's different types of dancers out there. And um, each dinner has uh, at least two or three dancers that showcase traditional dancing and and they get to explain what that means to them and um, kind of their story about getting into dance because not every Native American person dances. So it's a very like special thing that they choose to do with their with their time. 
Um, and so the dinner series highlights indigenous ingredients, obviously tells the stories of my plant relatives and really brings that connectedness back to the table um, and really connecting to the food. So that's one. The second one is I am currently writing a cookbook. It's called Gets Plate, a celebration of fire and fusion, uh, just to uh, bring in the tie of being a part of a um, my tribe is Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, and we're known as the Fire Keepers. So um, I'm not going to release too much information about that, but synopsis is basically bringing both the fusion and the fire to the recipes. So um, I have the cookbook. And then what else am I doing right now? I think those are the two most important things that are going on is just the chef's tables, the cookbook, and um, trying to build my social media platform to get more people interested uh, uh, like about Native American indigenous cuisine. So I'm doing some um, educational videos on ingredients and uh, fun recipes. So those are things that I'm working on currently. As as if that wasn't enough, but. <laughs> yeah, and that's oh. like half of what I actually am doing, but like yeah. those are important ones. Yeah. Now, once we get off the call, you'll be like, oh yeah, I have uh, these six other projects I'm working on. Uh, thank you for that. I want to go ahead and open the floor. Kasha, can you help? Uh, can you help streamline the questions? I don't mind you uh, jumping on and speaking the questions. I want to make sure we get at least three or four out for her. They yes. are long. Sorry, <laughs> there's lots um, of questions for you. Well, thank you for answering about your cookbook because we got a few people asking about that. Are you part of any public event? Where can uh, we buy or taste your food? So right now, um, I don't have any dates released, but I am currently looking for um, locations to do the dinner series or different pop-ups. So if anyone follows my Instagram or my website, they will be posted there uh, probably by the end of this month for the upcoming chef's tables and pop-ups I'll be hosting in June and July. But there are three that are happening in L.A., I was just saying um, on a side call, I was like, we should have her do one at the library. Let's talk hey, about it. That's, yeah, we'll talk about it. That would be great, actually. We have a lot of comments um, and um, just, you know, agreeing with you and just being appreciative of your comment about being uh, from different backgrounds and some um, commented about having uh, excited to see you work with the Mexican indigenous foods. So uh, thank you for our audience for sharing that. Um, another person asked if you've seen um, the Netflix dom uh, documentary titled Gather. And yes. she says that uh, it's a great nexus to consider learning about indigenous and native American gastronomy culture and natural food sourcing. Yes, I have seen it and 100% is a, um, a great point of reference about native American cuisine. Another episode is on Padma Lakshmi, Lakshmi's um, season. I was looking at my phone to see if I could figure out which season it is. I think it's season one. She highlights Native American culture and food on one of her um, episodes in uh, Taste of the Nation. I'm a huge fan of Padma Lakshmi, but she has one that's really, really good point of reference that um, really talks about both Native American and like South of the border food as well, as far as indigenous foods. So that's a good one to check out if anyone was looking for a recommendation outside of gather, but it's a great reference to, to the culture and the food. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have some more questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, I someone see. is asking. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, oh, see. No, I wanted back. to I wanted to ask this one because I think this is an important one, but please keep pulling out the questions here. Um, what are some of the ways and we get this one a lot when we when we're dealing with um, people of color and communities of color? What are some of the ways uh, you feel that we can get in touch with our Native American history? This question has come up before with another um, another guest. Uh, particularly for those folks who are not associated with a tribe. Like, do you have any recommendations about so how one, one might get in? That one's really, really tough because unfortunately it's a situation where you do have to have like family members names. So if there's someone within your family that you would think that, you know, like a grandmother's name, it's easy to go to the tribe that you think you might be associated with and, um, you know, see if there's anywhere on any of their, um, their rosters of enrollment rosters or anything of that nature. But if you don't have a name, unfortunately, it's really, really hard to trace that lineage back. 
Um, my biggest suggestion, if you are wanting to, if you find out, you know, you did a 23andMe or Ancestry.com thingy, and you find out that you have native blood in you, my biggest uh, recommendation, and I cannot speak for all of Native Americans, but for us, it's, you know, for people that have been raised with the traditions, it's really like hard for us to be able to just start, you know, accepting a bunch of people in when it's like, oh, like, okay, you just found out you're, you know, 10% Cherokee or something, or you think that you're Cherokee. Um, the thing that I can do is just recommend that you be as um, curious as possible. Like just start asking questions and just saying, hey, you know, um, asking people around you that you think are might native, or if you, you know, have anyone on your social media account that you follow their accounts, maybe that would be great questions to ask them. But me specifically, I would just say, do what feels right to you. You know, like only you, only how you feel about yourself is, is really what matters. And if you feel like one day you want to go like light a bundle of sage and, and, and start kind of like trying to feel some of that connection and ask creator for guidance, like you're probably going to feel something or hear something or get a sign or, or something. And I'm a very spiritual person. So my recommendations are always to go within, you know, try to connect with creator and ask those type of questions. But it's really hard if you don't have family members names to connect with specific tribes, but find community that is accepting of that and are willing to bring you in. Um, not all natives are going to be, you know, very uh, welcoming to it. Unfortunately, it's not not like it's a bad thing, but they're like, oh, OK, we've heard this one. Your great, great, great mother was a Cherokee princess. Like we've all heard it. And so sometimes you'll get like an occasion like eye roll. But I don't do that to people. I know people that do do that. And my my suggestion is always, you know, just go within, you know, ask yourself questions. If you don't find anyone that's going to like specifically help you or you know or you don't have names of anyone in your family I would just you know go within um ask creator you know you start to educate yourself about the culture about plant medicine about you know things that you can do for yourself that feel like you know right to do ceremonially um but um, I don't know it's a really hard question that's that's kind of why I posed it because we've heard that very question now several times in several instances. And I think that you articulated that very well. It's complex, right? It's small, close-knit communities um, that has years and years of degradation. And so I imagine just welcoming everyone in is a challenge. And so yes. there are steps. There are iter it's an iterative process. And I think what you said uh, really resonates, which is start from within before you seek affirmation out, right? So I love that. I wanted to ask this question and then I'll give it back to you, Kasha, um, because I think this is a great question. Um, someone says, I love the name Piet. Does it have any meaning uh, in uh, Native American culture? So, I wanted to ask that too. Yeah. So Piet is short for a much longer name. It's Piet Wetmokwe. And um, it was my great grandmother's name that was given to me. And um, so within our tribe or within our family and our tribe for Prairie Bend Potawatomi, the families stay, the names stay within the family. So they're passed down generation to generation. So Piet Whitmokwe is my great grandmother's name was gifted to me. I go by Piet for short. And basically um, I've done a lot of research. I've asked a lot of uh, fluent speakers within my community of what it means. And sometimes there aren't names that have like super harmonious cool, you know, translations or anything. Um, but the closest translation that we have found, and these are like all members of my family, obviously, um, uh, have told me this specific. Well, I have some people that were like, oh, it doesn't mean anything. And then we have fluent speakers in our family that are like, actually, it does have a meaning, but it's something to the effect of like something loud coming at you. <laughs> so it's not like, oh, beautiful butterfly or like, you know, a little bear or anything. It's like something loud, like coming like over a mountain towards you or something. Like, so th that's me. Like, like a presence, something yeah, big like something this way that, comes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's what is, that's the closest translation that we found. Um, so yeah, that's the answer to that. I wish it was something more el like elegant and beautiful, but you know. I think it's, that's I'll actually quite amazing. It kind of speaks to the very short time I've had with you. It speaks to your personality. So I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's I, great I think too, because it's like family. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Kasha, we have time for one more one more question. Do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. It looks like, and I'm curious too, what was it like working with celebrity chefs? And how was it working with uh, Gordon Ramsay and Richard Blaze? So it's actually really awesome to be able to have time with them because they have this wealth of knowledge and being able to have access to that. You know, these are phenomenal chefs that have been in the industry for many, 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 many years. They've been through all the scenarios and they are super successful for a reason. And so you can spend literally five minutes with them and ask them one question and they can give you like a master class, you know, like right, right then and there. And like, they have so much knowledge. I think that was my favorite part with working with celebrity chefs is just being in their presence and hearing their advice. Um, And they just have so much knowledge to pass down. And I think that's really, really amazing. And of course, like you're with a bunch of creatives, like people that are passionate about their, you know, about their work and they're able to encapsulate all their passion into like these projects. And, and that's obviously what I love to do. And so it's, it's so awesome to be around like-minded people that are, have reached the level of success that I'm trying to reach and being able to like ask them questions and stuff. I'm, I'm like a little sponge. I'm always curious. And so I think, you know, that was my favorite part with working with them. It was super intimidating at the beginning because I had a little bit of, um, what do they call the imposter syndrome, but I eventually broke out of that. But once I realized, you know, you, you're the only person that can hold yourself back from what you really want to achieve in life. And once I realized that part, I was like, oh, okay, I don't need to feel lack thereof. I need to show up confident and, and be ready to put the work in and be ready to ask the questions. And so once I figured that out, everything, my whole perspective changed. Wow. Um, if we had another hour, we could get through the questions. I have to tell you, we do these all the time. I don't think I've seen this many questions uh, oh. for, for one speaker. Pia, oh. you've been such a, such a great person to interview, and I would love to bring you back in some capacity or other. We'll work something out. Um, thank you, Kasha, once again. I want to thank everyone who joined us today to be respectful of PS time. Um, We appreciate you. This is our Trailblazers program. We do this every about every month or so. And thank you for joining us. Yeah, of course. And I just want to leave you guys with like a quick thank you for having me. Um, I'm always appreciative of the opportunity to tell my story and to talk about my culture and be able to highlight um, both Native American and Mexican culture because obviously that's something I'm very passionate about. So thank you all in uh, the chat that have been very curious and asking amazing questions. Thank you, Sky, for being an amazing host. And for the rest of the crew here, Bryant, Tasha, and Jessica for having me. It's been so amazing. And thank you to everyone who, who was interested in watching this and hearing our conversation. I really, really appreciate the support. So one thing I'll say before I leave, before she starts the music, there is someone in the chat who's, I don't know where she's at. She said, I fly there to see her or to be a to one of her pop-ups so you know it might be a great idea to plug your social media right now or maybe your website exactly yeah so i have uh, a pietsplate.com very it's my name with the followed by the word plate um is my website so www there you go so those are all of my handles you have instagram you have youtube if you're curious about any recipes that i currently have out there Um, There's some educational stuff on Instagram, but Instagram, I'm on all the time. So I'm in my stories, releasing, dropping things that are where I'm at, what I'm doing. And so I have another amazing conversation I'll be having next week with some folks. So so you guys can come to that. It's a public event. Um, So all of that will be posted on websites and Instagram. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. We appreciate you and we'll see you in the near future. Take good care of yourself. Thanks everyone. Bye.